Okay. Um, good afternoon and welcome to yet another extremely topical and extremely timely AMET webinar. Um, we are living in very uncertain times. Um, after a 20 year experience in Afghanistan, um, we have approximately six days before um, the American armed forces are going to retreat, um, leaving behind thousands of um, Afghani women who had hoped to be able to see some enlightenment from under the Shador, um, and um, many, many Afghanis who had worked together with us. Um, and of course, there are Americans that are still hoping to get out. Um, nothing happens in a vacuum. And um, we know that um, this has emboldened many of America and Israel's enemies. And um, it leaves our friends feeling a little bewildered, betrayed. Um, so today we are here to speak to one of um, my heroes, um, one of the few people in the world that I respect immensely. Um, her name is a Lieutenant Colonel Sarit Sahadi, and um, Sarit has spoken with us before. Um, she is the CEO, CEO and founder of AMA, a nonprofit and an independent research and education center that specializes specifically in the security challenges for the state of Israel on its northern border. Um, Sarit has briefed hundreds and hundreds of groups and forums ranging from members of the American Congress to journalists and visiting MPs um, and VIP groups um, in Israel and overseas. Um, Sarit has written numerous position papers and updates um, focusing on Lebanon, Syria, and Israel's national security challenges. She had served for 15 years in the Israeli Defense Forces with distinction, specializing in military intelligence. Sarit holds an MA in Middle Eastern Studies from Ben Gurion University, and she lives um, with her five children and her husband in Western Galilee. Um, so Sarit, um, you are here during these very uncertain times to tell us what sort of ramifications the American withdrawal from Afghanistan has on Hezbollah and Hamas and other terrorist organizations. Hi, so uh, good evening from Israel. And I'm very excited to be with you here today. Uh, it has been a rough week and an interesting week uh, in Afghanistan and in the Middle East. Uh, I'll try to bring uh, kind of an overview to, to your question. Uh, so I, I'm trying to, you know, to compare a little bit, okay? And uh, in both cases, whether it's Afghanistan or Hamas or Hezbollah, uh, the other side, like Taliban, Hamas, Hezbollah, experienced an experience of victory. Uh, whether it's in South Lebanon, Israel is a unilaterally uh, withdrawal in the year 2000, whether it's from Gaza, we had withdrawn in 2005, again, without no agreement with Hamas. And uh, in all three cases, this uh, redrawal is uh, perceived uh, as a defeat, as a weakness. And this narrative of defeat and weakness is not uh, new. Okay, what you are now seeing uh, all over your media in the United States for us, it's not new. It's something that is uh, being well indoctrinated um, at least in the past 20 years and maybe more. And uh, of course, uh, both uh, players, Hamas and Hezbollah, are taking advantage of what happened uh, to strengthen this narrative that the United States is weak, that the United States state is defeated, that this is the, the preload, the, the, the promotion to the withdrawal from uh, the whole area from the Middle East, not only of the United States, but also, as Hamas said, the Israeli, the occupation, what they call the occupation uh, in Palestine. Uh, Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, also said that the United States uh, make sure to, and he's lying, of course, he's a good liar, uh, United States make sure to take off all its equipment 
from Afghanistan, but it didn't uh, make sure to take off those who uh, co cooperated with her. Uh, of course, this is not exactly the case, but that's the narrative. Uh, the leader of uh, Hamas, Ismail Aniya, called Taliban and uh, uh, wished them success, uh, blessed them for what they were doing in Afghanistan. And I want to share with you uh, some cartoons that were published in uh, Palestinian media and Hamas media uh, by a cartoon producer named Umaya Juha. And what is she saying? Uh, she's saying that uh, those who are uh, uh, counting like Israel should learn from what has happened in Afghanistan. We will have the same uh, destiny. The next cartoon is saying, look what happened to those who are uh, helping the United States. Uh, 2021, they are left behind, the United States is living. These are just uh, two examples uh, to the way what happened in Afghanistan is being perceived here in the region. Does what happened in Afghanistan change uh, the policy or the reality here? No, it just strengthens the current narrative, as I explained. Uh, but the process of, uh, of absence of United States from the region didn't start now. And the feeling of this absence didn't start now. It's something that had started uh, years ago. And I think that uh, there is a lot of work to be done now uh, to fight this narrative and to change this narrative, but I will get to that uh, later on. Uh, I want to say one word about Lebanon itself and about Hezbollah. Because there are a lot of questions now. Uh, and Nasrallah took advantage of what happened in Afghanistan to strengthen his own image inside Lebanon. What we see now in Lebanon in the past few days is not very encouraging. We see how truly everybody is corrupted. Everybody from all political uh, players, hided medicines, hided oil and fuel, uh, were uh, trading this in the black market, whether it's Hezbollah and others. Uh, and the feeling is that uh, Hezbollah is like taking over gradually and slowly, but this is happening in light of this corruption, which is uh, something that everybody is doing. Uh, as for the, 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 we sometimes want to compare between the Lebanese army and the Afghan army. So here I must say it's not the same thing because the United States is not inside Lebanon and Israel is not inside Lebanon the way uh, it, is, it was inside Afghanistan. Moreover, I don't think there is an interest uh, within Hezbollah uh, to completely collapse the Lebanese army because the Lebanese army is already cooperating with Hezbollah. So why, why destroying it? It's, it's a great tool. It is working. Um, so this is just a few you know, notes about, about Lebanon. About Syria, there are interesting reports that uh, members of the Shiite uh, militia, the Shiite Afghani militia named Fatim Yun, who is uh, positioned by the Iranians uh, in Syria, and mostly, by the way, in eastern Syria, next to the border uh, with Iraq, uh, went on a strike, demanding from their Iranian boss to defend their families in Afghanistan. And of course, the question is, if these reports are true, uh, what are they going to do with these Afghani uh, families? Are they going to evacuate them? Where to? To Syria? Interesting option. Um, let's test the, the responses from the Middle East for the, you know, uh, powers in the Middle East. Uh, they were very cautious. Uh, they all said, okay, uh, you know, waiting, all of them expressed like somebody is waiting to see what exactly will happen in Afghanistan. They, everybody has something to be afraid of, you know, the Iranians are uh, afraid of uh, damaging and assaulting the Shiites in Afghanistan. The Saudis, of course, are afraid that uh, what happened in Afghanistan will repeat itself elsewhere in the Middle East. Uh, the, Middle East the United States will pull out its uh, alliance uh, with other players here. I'm not saying this will happen. I'm saying that this is the feeling or this is the fear. Uh, Turkey is worried of more refugees. And yet none of them uh, denounced uh, the Taliban. None of them denounced what exactly is happening there. They were very cautious. They are still waiting uh, because that's the situation. And in the Middle East, if this is the situation, now let's see what advantage can we have of this situation. Like if you can't win, if you can't beat them, uh, join them. 
So basically, these are the responses here in the Middle East, and I, I want it was important for me to put them in, in the right proportions because it's not it's not going to bring to a change in the policy, but it is definitely uh, encouraging uh, local and uh, already ongoing trends over here in the Middle East. Thank you, thank you. That's very comprehensive. Um, sorry. Um, over the past 21 years, since the IDF withdrew from southern Lebanon on May 24th, 2000, the border has been relatively quiet. According to UNIFIL, the United Nations Internal Forces in Lebanon, six rockets have been fired into Israel from southern Lebanon so far this year. And on August 4th alone, three rockets were fired. What accounts for the sudden escalation? First, uh, what is relatively quiet? It's important for me to explain this to people in America. Relatively quiet means that we had about 30 incidents of rockets firing from Lebanon or Syria to Israel, maybe more than 30 in the past 15 years. Uh, 30 incidents of rocket firing, most of them included much more than one rocket. Okay, so it's much more than 30 rockets. Not all of them, by the way, landed in Israel. Some of them landed in Lebanon, endangering the Lebanese as well. Other uh, were intercepted by Iron Dome, and other landed in Lebanon. Uh, I agree, Sarah, that um, we had like a bunch of uh, rocket shooting incidents in the past two months, six incidents, but not six rockets, much more than that, that most of them were carried out by uh, Palestinian groups, uh, probably Hamas, we don't exactly know, but we assume uh, it's probably Hamas. And the context is different from one incident to another, and it's important for me to clarify because it's very complicated to understand. We have seen before rocket shooting during IDF's operation in Gaza. It's not the first time. It happened almost in every operation during or a little bit afterwards. We have seen rocket launching from Lebanon uh, as if to send a message of, uh, uh, you know, we identified with Palestinians, etc. cetera. Uh, what was very interesting is that this uh, rocket launching continued after the IDF operation in Gaza ended and Palestinian organizations continued to launch more rockets afterwards. And to our assessment, this happened because uh, for two reasons, actually. The first reason is that Iran and Hamas and Hezbollah made it very clear uh, during the operation that there is like what we call new equation in the region. Uh, and this new equation means that anything that happens between Israelis and Palestinians in Jerusalem, in Israel, in Gaza, in West Bank is also interesting uh, and is also will be addressed by uh, Hezbollah, by Hamas in Lebanon, uh, I don't know, by players of Iran in, uh, in Syria, and by actually Iranians proxy in the region. The second reason this happened is because Lebanon, uh, uh, surprisingly enough, became um, a more comfortable uh, area to launch from than Gaza itself. And it's funny to say this because kind of deterrent was created uh, after the current operation in Gaza. And I'm very cautious with the way I, I phrase myself because I know it can happen, it can change tonight. But uh, Hamas found it much more comfortable to launch from Lebanon because everybody understood that Israel is not going to war in Lebanon in this kind of, uh, you know, uh, crisis, internal crisis in Lebanon. So everybody has their own restraints. After... Uh, few rocket launching that probably were made or, or again we assume they were made above the head of Hezbollah. Hezbollah had to send a message to internal arena in Lebanon saying we are the boss here in South Lebanon not Hamas. We are the protectors of Lebanon not Hamas and we are also part of this equation that I've just explained and that's, that's why we had seen the six a rocket incident uh, of launching this time 20 uh, rockets, not 20 rockets that were launched at the same time. Now you can see uh, the rocket launcher on the left side uh, after it was caught by Druze 
uh, population, the, the shooting was made by Drew's area, and you can see the launching itself, uh, how it looks like. Almost 20 rockets uh, being launched at the same time, almost at the same time, one after the other. Uh, half of them landed uh, in Israel uh, in open areas. They were all launched into military areas in Israel. Half of them were intercepted by Iron Dome. These are not Palestinian rockets. This is different. Hezbollah failed, by the way. Hezbollah wanted to send a message to the internal arena in Lebanon, and it failed uh, because uh, they, they made a mistake and they launched from Druze areas. Uh, Hezbollah is Shiite. The Druze didn't like it. They filmed everything. They caught the launcher. They caught the rockets. Uh, they caught the Hezbollah operative uh, that launched the rockets. You can see in the video. Uh, this is the Hezbollah operative being uh, brought into the vehicle, uh, afraid and humiliated. And these videos were published all over the media in Lebanon, all over the media in the Arab world. So Hezbollah failed to achieve his goal this time. But of course, when we speak about Israel, uh, the feeling in Israel was that something also changed with uh, the deterrent of Hezbollah because it's the first time in 15 years that Hezbollah launched rockets claiming responsibility uh, towards Israel. It didn't happen for 15 years. You talked about relatively quiet. This is, this is what relatively quiet means. It did launch anti-tank missiles that killed IDF soldiers in the past 15 years, but not, not like that, not 20 rockets. This is a different incident. And there is still the question where this is heading, you know? Right. It's a, the, the one silver lining behind this is the Druze response. That's amazing. Um, I also find it really interesting that they did this on August 4th, which was the one year anniversary of the um, explosion and their, their port of Beirut. Do you think that was also to send a message? I'm not sure, but it, for me, you know, and maybe I'm interpreting this as an Israeli, they just don't care. You know, it was from their own need to send a message to the Lebanese. And, and they truly really don't care whether how, how deep is Lebanon in this crisis. And of course, we've seen this also with the tries to establish a new government and everything that is now happening in Lebanon. Right, right, right. Um, Lebanon is certainly a failed state. It's, it's horrible. Um, and speaking of UNIFIL, um, how capable is UNIFIL of enforcing UN security? Council Resolution 1701. So, you know what? When I uh, was preparing to this uh, webinar, I went through all the incidents, all the clashes between Hezbollah and UNIFIL in the past year, only in the past year. And there were quite a few, some of them inside UNIFIL of, uh, area of operation, and sometimes when UNIFIL forces were on their way from Beirut to their area of operation in South Lebanon. And, you know, I've been researching this in for too long, let's put it this way, <laughs> and nothing has changed. The reports are always the same report of a unifield force that is entering an area which is not supposed to be in, though, as I've said, in many cases, it is inside unifield area of operation. Sometimes it is mentioned that this is an area like an orchard or a farm or, you know, um, agriculture area. Are you, uh, did you hear Hezbollah force entering into an area it's not supposed to be in? Hezbollah you... is always blocking Unifil way, well. uh, attacking the vehicle, uh, taking their cameras, taking some of their equipment. In some of the cases we have seen taking even their weapon. Unifil is an armed force. Uh, in the, but the interesting is how it is reported in Lebanon. It is always said that uh, the patrol of UNIFIL was not confirmed or coordinated with the Lebanese army, as if it should be coordinated with the Lebanese army, uh, that UNIFIL was not allowed to enter these places. And eventually, the Lebanese army intelligence came in, so stopped the clashes, uh, but not always returned uh, UNIFIL its equipment that was taken by Hezbollah. And it's unbelievable. This has been going on in the past 15 years. Nothing has changed. Uh, always the same reports. Uh, sometimes the report says people of the village, but we understand it's not people of the village. It's not just people of the village. It's Hezbollah 
that is living in these villages. And of course, as you've seen, uh, UNIFIL failed to stop uh, rocket launching uh, towards Israel, uh, anti-tank launching towards Israel, uh, excavation of tunnels, border crossing tunnels into Israel, and of course, the fact that Hezbollah is holding is uh, one third of its rockets in UNIFIL area of operation uh, inside the towns, inside the villages, uh, in the opposite uh, of 1701, the, the resolution that you've mentioned, that said that the area should be empty of illegitimate weapons. So the bottom line, if you're talking about a peacekeeping force, it, is, it has very limited and partial uh, success, mainly in moderating between the sides, uh, civilians. Uh, there are a lot of civilian issues between both sides because civilians are living on both sides. There are orchards, there are farmers working on both sides. And it's, and I, I personally think that it's important to have an international uh, force like the UN uh, based on the border that can actually intermediate uh, between the sides. But I'm not sure that we need 10,000 soldiers and I'm definitely sure that they are not fulfilling their mission with regard to 1701. So, for me, it's time for a new strategy with regard to UNIFIL. Right. And in terms of the Lebanese armed forces themselves, um, how much um, of a bulwark are they against Hezbollah? Oh, they are not. Okay, so it's important for me to clarify. And again, this is my own opinion. From what we have seen, the Lebanese army uh, is cooperating with Hezbollah. Uh, there, there is a majority of combat soldiers of the Shiite uh, population because the majority is the Shiite population in Lebanon. That's the demography. This is the biggest uh, Shiite sect in Lebanon. Nobody knows the exact numbers. Nobody had counted the Lebanese since the 30s of the previous century. We don't exactly know, but we understand that uh, there is cooperation. As you could see, the cooperation in concealing what Hezbollah is doing in South Lebanon I can personally testify that uh, two weeks ago, I was, uh, I, I took um, a reporter uh, to the border, to the Israeli-Lebanese border, which is uh, half a mile, half an hour drive from where I am now. And uh, we were standing next to the border crossing tunnel. And just on the other side of the border, in a distance of uh, about 200 feet from us, we saw a Hezbollah operative probably a member of Radwan uh, brigades, which are the commando brigades that Hezbollah trained to infiltrate into Israel, standing openly on top of a rock in a place that he made sure that we can see him, and he was taking pictures of us. But the interesting thing is that next to him was standing a Lebanese army soldier. And they were just, you know, uh, talking and being friends and Lebanese army soldier didn't uh, prevent him from doing anything. And of course, this is an example to, to what is truly happening. So the Lebanese army will not fight Hezbollah, uh, will not defeat Hezbollah. And I think uh, for you Americans, uh, giving assistance to the Lebanese army uh, should not, the reason should not be creating an alternative to Hezbollah. The reason might be uh, preventing a vacuum like what is happening now in Afghanistan, if you like, uh, preserving the influence of United States in Lebanon, but it's definitely not creating an alternative. Right. Unfortunately, um, Ahmet has been working assiduously on this issue for a very, very long time, but there are um, people from the Lebanese Armed Forces that lobby the Department of Defense, and they say that they are um, a, a countervailing force against Hezbollah, and we've, it's been a, a very, very different, difficult argument. I'd love to take you with me to Capitol Hill, um, sorry, to, to let them hear your firsthand experiences. You know, um, you know, Sarah, all I can say to your note is that if, if this is what they say, so one should ask them a very simple question. Why don't you fulfill 1701? Why don't you prevent Hezbollah from deploying in South Lebanon? Because everybody agreed that Hezbollah has ammunition in South Lebanon. What are you doing about that? Right, right, right. Thank you, Sarit. 
Um, can you tell us a little something about Hezbollah's network of underground tunnels? And I know you've done a beautiful um, research study about this. And if you can tell us also who's funding this vast operation. Yes. Okay. So the, the, I will start from your last question. Who is funding? I think the, the answer, um, the answer is, is like the same answer about Hezbollah's budget. Okay. What, what, uh, where, and, and there are different uh, evaluations about Hezbollah's budget. Uh, the current evaluation, by the way, also of American think tanks is that 70% uh, of the budget of Hezbollah comes from Iran and about 30% comes from uh, self-income, self-finance. Self-finance means um, drugs, drug money, uh, and we are, we are about to, to issue a report about that as well, uh, the drug traffic in our neighborhood, uh, uh, from crime money, from corruption, and also from donations that are also coming from overseas. And I must show you something that we have seen today Um, look at that. Somebody wanted to help the Lebanese with really, uh, and I truly believe this, innocent intentions, uh, looking at what the Lebanese uh, are going through. I must say that also in Israel, there are voices that we must help the Lebanese. And uh, published a, a link to donations. And you know, my grandmother was born in Beirut. So I, 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 I felt you know, that I want to donate, you know, this is a great platform to donate. Uh, nobody will know that you're an Israeli, you just donate and that's it. And then I see that it is Betel Mal. Betel Mal is one of the financial institutions of Hezbollah. And it is sanctioned by the United States. So, you know, sometimes people with good intentions uh, actually are uh, donating money to Hezbollah without knowing that. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to share who it was that published this? Uh, the person's name is Khaled Baidun. I don't know who he is. I uh, saw this in the feed of Rashida Talib, uh, the congresswoman Rashid. Rashida Talib. Right, right. Uh, I saw it. I saw it from and, and I truly, again, I truly believe she just wanted to help the Lebanese the same way I would want to help the Lebanese, but uh, Betel Mal, it, the money will not get to the Lebanese. And maybe some of it, but definitely not all of it. Um, very, I think you're being very generous to Congresswoman Rashida. <laughs> uh, you know, I haven't met her, so I'm trying to be as generous as possible. But uh, let's talk about the tunnels now. Look, uh, we knew, we knew during the years, when I'm saying we knew, I'm speaking about either the IDF or Israelis in general, we knew during the years that there is uh, uh, underground infrastructure of Hezbollah in South Lebanon, below the towns there, uh, to hide their ammunition there. And then we also learned in 2018, there is also underground infrastructure of Hezbollah, uh, border crossing tunnels that are, uh, I'm just trying, looking for the slide, border crossing tunnels. One minute, okay. Uh, that are meant to enable the Radwan brigades, the commander brigades of Hezbollah, to enter into Israel when they get the order to, uh, to attack communities, to attack IDF positions that are next to the border, and there are many communities and IDF positions next to the border. But underground infrastructure is um, a strategy. It's a, it's a strategy that is being used every elsewhere in the world. You've seen this in Vietnam. I've seen this in Vietnam when I visited Vietnam. Uh, you've seen this in uh, uh, North Korea. We've seen this in Iran. So why not elsewhere in Lebanon? And then we started to search and we had uh, found uh, in reports, actually in Lebanese media, testimony uh, that made us understand or made us believe that there is kind of an interregional uh, net of Hezbollah. You can see here the tunnel of Hezbollah that was already found in the border. That's the tunnel uh, half an hour drive from here. And this is a North Korean tunnel and they received the help from a North Korean company to excavate the tunnels. 
The idea is to uh, create a capability to move underground between Hezbollah different operational areas. Hezbollah defi divided Lebanon to operational areas. I hope you can see my clicker. Beirut is the headquarters. South Lebanon is the second and first defense lines. And Baka Valley is the operational and logistic uh, base. If you create in this area where my clicker is, just below the word Lebanon, a net of channels that enables you to move without anybody knows uh, beneath the ground, you can have a, an excellent operational achievement. Of course, it costs a lot of money. You asked about the financing. It's highly complicated uh, to excavate underground in a very rocky soil, but nobody believed that there are uh, border crossing tunnels here in Israel, and we found them. Uh, the same in, in North Korea. And, and when we researched this, we also, it was also hard for us hard to believe. But when we re researched this, uh, we saw that Hezbollah went to study from the North Koreans in the 90s. So this has been going on for a long time. And they had enough time to excavate tens of uh, kilometers or miles, maybe even more, we don't know. And uh, we found um, the name of the company that helped Hezbollah. They were present in Lebanon. They uh, gave advice to Hezbollah of how to do that. And they were also received the help from uh, an Iranian general. Now, this is very awkward. An Iranian general of the IRGC, of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, was the head of a civilian company that was responsible for this tunneling project. So if it is a civilian company, why there is a general that is directing it? Uh, one, so, you know, this is one, one question. Uh, in the report that we had found from 2008, uh, they also talked about Hezbollah blocking areas in the same area that you could see, this area, uh, next to Jizin, you can see in my map, this is Jizin. Uh, blocking the way of the people that are living there. These are Christians that are living there, by the way. Uh, blocking the way, and the Christians that were stopped by Hezbollah, interrogated by Hezbollah, say they couldn't see anything above the ground. So why they are being stopped? Why they are being interrogated? Why are the barriers along the ways uh, in these areas, in these you know, open areas, forested areas? Something is happening uh, below the ground. Uh, the picture that you saw, this is the general, the Iranian general that was the head of the uh, Iranian company. In the same report, uh, they named places, specific places of where the tunnel is. And we put these places in a map. And then we saw that we can actually connect the dots. And we connected the dots. And it looks like, okay, it makes sense because this, and, and there may, of course, we believe, we believe, we don't know, but we believe that there may be more, that's the whole idea. But it makes sense because this tunnel begins from a uh, Western area, uh, ended again due to the information, there is probably more, you know, a little bit east to there, and it is located uh, over here, just in between all these operational areas of Hezbollah. Of course, all the uh, elaborated information uh, with the names of the companies and the way they are collaborating uh, is in our report. I will now uh, share this report in the chat. Um, so everybody will be able to read the original report. And it, it was also published uh, in the media, by the way, also in Lebanese media and uh, our media in Arabic and Saudi media, media and of course, in European media, American media, etc. Excellent, um, uh, but daunting, daunting. Um, before I open the floor up to questions, I, my final question to you is, um, if you have any parting words to our audience um, of mostly American and Western um, listeners who are friends of Israel and committed Zionists, what, what would they be at this point in time? I have a photo and I have something to say. 
have, I want to show you this photo. I don't know, I don't know what, what shaked you the most from the past uh, 10 days pictures from Afghanistan. There were many pictures, many horrifying pictures. But this picture for me expressed uh, something deeper. Uh, it's a woman, she's an American, she's a reporter. Uh, and you know how Afghanistan changed in one night and in one night, uh, everything went backwards in 20 years. There is no new Taliban. Okay, there is Taliban. It's the same ideology. Maybe they are a little bit more pragmatic, but it's the same ideology. And every American should bear this in mind because it's the same Taliban who trained Al-Qaeda that uh, carried out September 11. What can be done? Uh, I think... And, and President Biden said that fighting terrorism is extremely important. It's not only important because it's fighting terrorism, it's also important because this is the message that should be sent now from the United States. That the fact that the United States had withdrawn from Afghanistan does not mean that it is not fighting terror. And terror is terror is terror, whether it's Taliban, Hamas, or Hezbollah. Terror is terror is terror, and it's everywhere, and we, we should fight this. The second thing that is highly important, and here maybe Israel is even in a better position now because we are the only democracy here in the Middle East, is to strengthen the, alliance, the alliances uh, here in the Middle East with Israel, but also with others, uh, Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, they are expecting this. It will send the, the right message to these countries. It will help us all together to fight terror, uh, whether it's radical Shiite or radical Sunni. The last uh, note is very unpopular, but I think it's very important. Uh, look, a lot of money was invested in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in, I don't know how much in Syria. Uh, but for me, there is a question, how much money was invested in schools, in universities, in educating the Syrian refugees uh, in the refugee camps, or outside of the refugee camps. Now we are going to have uh, thousands of Afghani refugees. If they will not be educated with Western education, they will be educated otherwise. Uh, education, and this is something that could be, uh, the, should be the mission of all Western countries, whether it's United States or Europe, to put education as first priority. It's not popular because the fruits uh, only 20 years afterwards, but it's highly important because you've seen what happened in Afghanistan, 20 years and the army uh, ran away in two nights. Uh, they, very few of them left to fight and I don't know what their chances are. Right, right. Um, we couldn't agree with you more. In fact, um, a whole other issue we've been working on is the kind of education that, and the quality of the education, particularly in the UNRWA schools. But in general, um, I think it's very, it, it is so depressing to see um, the Afghani women having to go back, you know, into the shadows under their shadors and not being able to actualize their potential. It's criminal, it's just criminal. So, you know, yes, yes. Um, it's time for a little bit of enlightenment again. Um, and with that, I am going to open up the floor to my wonderful colleague, um, Hussein Abubakar Mansour, who will be um, reading some of the questions that have come in. Hussein? Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And thank you very much, uh, Sarid, for being with us today. I thank you very much for all our listeners who sent us a lot of questions that we're going to try to get through them as the time allows. Uh, the first question that we received, um, or actually, it's actually... It, it's one of the last questions, but I think it's good to start with. Concerning the tunnels, can the IDF destroy them like it destroys those of Hamas? And why isn't it doing so? <laughs> um, first, I'm not speaking on behalf of the IDF. I'm only presenting my own views. So as far as I can see it, uh, in Lebanon, IDF, you know what, also in Gaza, IDF is not initiating an operation without good reasons. Uh, in Gaza, whenever it, it, they like cross the lines, meaning that the lives of the people uh, that are living in southern Israel 
are becoming unbearable uh, with too many rockets incidents. So then you see an, an IDF operation in Gaza. If this will be the situation in the north, I guess that IDF it will do the same in the north. Uh, but I believe uh, the, the first priority of the IDF will be defending Israelis. Uh, and this will be a great uh, mission, uh, a great challenge because defending Israelis, uh, while the rockets are in very populated areas, it's quite a challenge. And it's a question how exactly to do that. And you've seen a demo in Gaza. And in Gaza, IDF targeted very specific targets uh, with that uh, in areas that where IDF could uh, warn the population, effectively warn the population. And the attack of the IDF against what uh, was called Hamas Metro uh, was highly important in uh, fighting Hamas. But unfortunately, without uh, any capability from our side to understand that this will happen, uh, killing some civilians in Gaza. Many of the civilians that were killed in Gaza were killed in this specific attack because the homes above the tunnels uh, collapsed. And we didn't know that, that this is what will happen. So there are always risks in this kind of attacks. And that's why IDF would not do that unless the situation in northern, on the northern borders will deteriorate greatly. Thank you. Um, the second question is um, about actually the recent uh, United States debacle in Afghanistan. How do you think uh, such a hasty withdrawal impact the relationship with Russia and China and impacts their calculations for moves within uh, the Middle East? I don't know. All I can say is that um, in the Middle East, everybody try to, except for Israel, I guess, uh, everybody try to keep all the options open. And you see this with Lebanon, you've seen this uh, even with Saudi Arabia, uh, you've seen this with Jordan, uh, you've seen this with Egypt. The dialogue, uh, the cooperation with Russia and China uh, is ongoing. Um, I don't think that the withdrawal itself will cause to a change in a shift in policy. Uh, it's really a question of what messages will the current administration in Washington will send to these allies. That's why I've said that there is a lot to be done now and they are not lost, these countries. Thank you. And speaking of those allies, uh, Iraq just invited the Iranian president, uh, the new Iranian, pres Iranian president, Ibrahim Raisi, and officials from Arab countries to a summit this Saturday in Iraq. Uh, what are the implications for Israel um, in the light of a potential Arab-Iranian reproachment? This is, it's connect, it is connected to your previous question. And I must say that we also tried to check this just before this webinar, because we were wondering about the connections between Jordan and Iran, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a visit of the Jordanian king and the Egyptian prime minister in Iraq, uh, which they agreed on collaboration in, with the oil uh, pipes. And now you are saying that uh, Raisi is coming to, to Iraq. Uh, Iraq is, it's, is tricky. Iraq is tricky because we see Shiite forces in Iraq that are against uh, Iran. And we also see the militias in Iraq that are very well based there. And they are the proxies of Iran in Iraq. Uh, so definitely it's not a good sign to see Raisi uh, in Iraq, specifically Raisi. Uh, but again, uh, remember the sentence, if you can't win them, join them. And this is what uh, Iraq, I guess, this is what the Iraqis are doing. And now uh, we, 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 you guys, need to make sure that, that uh, the Egyptians and the Jordanians will not join. Um, given, of course, the uh, urgency of uh, the question of Afghanistan and the resulting questions. We received a lot of, a lot of questions uh, about this, so we're gonna continue with this line of thought. Um, now, we talked about this increasing perception uh, of a security vacuum, and you just talked about how everybody in the Middle East uh, keeps their options uh, open and there's a serious commitment problem. Is it possible in any way for Israel to uh, fill some of the void America is leaving behind and uh, some of those security commitments that America might be relinquishing. 
in a very limited way. Uh, Israel, uh, you know, Israel, United States, we cannot replace a superpower, okay? Let's not be mistaken. We can definitely give uh, some backing. Uh, I guess that there will be a lot of, there is already a lot of cooperation uh, with uh, regard to security, with regard to uh, economy, and this is very good. But uh, it is not a, it does not replace a superpower. Unfortunately. <laughs> uh, now, um, one last question about Afghanistan, and then I'm going to move to more specific questions about Lebanon. Um, given the Iraqi and long history between Iran and Sunni Taliban, how likely is it that Iran will extend its power projection abilities to Afghanistan? Uh, it, okay, we discussed this today again in my staff. <laughs> you know, Iran is Shiite, Taliban are Sunni. Both of them are holding radical ideologies that we've seen them fighting against each other in the Middle East in our neighboring countries. So on the one hand, it's almost uh, impossible for us to believe that they will collaborate. On the other hand, we've seen them collaborating in the past. We've seen Iran involved in assisting Al-Qaeda around September 11th. We've seen this happening. So we cannot overrule that around uh, uh, attacks, terrorist attacks in the, in the West or against the West. By the way, not necessarily in the near future, maybe it will happen in a year or a few months after the Taliban will base itself in Afghanistan. Uh, we can see collaboration when it's, it's about money and you know, with technology. I don't know what was left in Afghanistan by the Americans. If there will be an interest of the Iranians to get something, of them, and they will be willing to pay, maybe the Taliban will be willing to sell. And so it's an open question, but I believe that uh, interest can overcome ideology. Thank you. Um, there are many reports, and you alluded to this, indicating that both Lebanon and Syria, as a matter of fact, are effectively becoming narco states. Um, are there any American international or regional efforts being seriously undertaken to confront this new uh, Middle Eastern drug cartel? Wow, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> With the ongoing collapse of the Lebanese state, are there any indications of fracturing within Hezbollah itself? No. No. I don't see, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I wish I had more good news. Uh, we have some reports about uh, defection. I'm not uh, sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, defection of soldiers from the Lebanese army. Right. Uh, okay, but not from Hezbollah. Uh, the, do you know if Israel had a Lebanese strategy beyond the mere containment of Hezbollah? Does Israel, for example, work with other Lebanese factions, Druze or otherwise, to dethrone Hezbollah and stabilize Lebanon? No, this is, the answer is definitely not. And I will explain why. We tried this in the past. Remember, we've tried this in 1982. We thought we can work with the Christians. And we failed for many reasons, by the way, but we failed eventually. And even when we had the Good Neighbor Project in Syria, uh, it was easier because the population uh, reached out to us. And all of this uh, Good Neighbor Project in Syria started from uh, the population reaching out to us. Here, we don't see this happening because Hezbollah is very well based on our border and it will not enable anybody to reach out to us. And it will be very, very dangerous. So for now, I don't see any uh, plans from the Israeli side to collaborate with Druze or Christians. Uh, I'm sorry, and there is not always a solution right. uh, to this crisis. Sometimes you just need to contain. Great, thank you. Uh, you mentioned the network of Hezbollah, Iran and North Korea. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the role North Koreans are playing uh, in the Hezbollah-Iran network? So we in Alma Center research the tunnels. So we understand that in the tunneling project, there is definitely an involvement of the North Koreans. 
Uh, we also know that there is an involvement of North Korea uh, with regard to the missiles project in Iran. But I, I don't know whether uh, Hezbollah is involved in this. I can only assume that if there is the Tananin project, there may be more, but we didn't research that yet. But it's a good idea. We'll try to take a look at that as well. Thank you. And uh, our last uh, question um, is, is it realistic to expect Israel to have plans to completely neutralize uh, Hezbollah anytime soon? Or is it simply out of question? This option is always on the table. Uh, but as I've said, the initiative will not come from the IDF unless there will be a very good reason for that. Uh, whether it will be a, an understanding here in Israel that the precision guided missiles are becoming strategic danger to Israel or whether it will be a situation in Northern Israel where me and my children will not have normal life and we will experience uh, rocket shooting incidents every day or almost every day. Right. So, um, Sarit, you do believe that Israel does have the capability if they do come to that determination, right? To defeat Hezbollah? Yes. We must have the capability. The question is when we will be stopped. Yes. Like in previous times against Hezbollah and Hamas, uh, because these organizations are using their own people as human shields, uh, we are being stopped. And as I've said, this is a true problem. We know it's a problem. We are aware of this problem. Horrible. There was also a question that flashed across my screen before from one of our viewers about um, Sheikh Nasrallah's health. Um, is he, um, there were rumors that he was sick. Um, is there an heir apparent for Sheikh Nasrallah? Nasrallah is pretty young. He's a little bit above 60. I don't remember the exact age. But uh, he was sick, we've seen in one of his speeches, but he is now okay. In the last uh, speeches, he looked fine. So uh, as far as we know, uh, they're not thinking of replacing him. Okay, um, so this has not been the most optimistic, unfortunately, um, of all of our webinars, but you know, we had a map and I'm sure the people at the Alma Research and Education Center um, believe that we have got to reveal the truth and not sugarcoat it. You know, our names. <laughs> are... <laughs> Look, we and and yet we are always optimistic because we are Israelis. We must be. Right, right. And Israel would never have been able to survive these seventy-three years without their indomitable. Um, sense of optimism, um, which has really sustained um, Israel and the, the entire Jewish people for so many years. And we really would like to thank Sarit Sahavi for, for her amazing optimistic, optimism um, and the incredibly good work that she does at the Alma Research and Education Center. And I would like to encourage everybody to please go on to their website. Um, Sarit, do you want to name the website? Um, yes, uh, I, I put one of the links to the link to the tunnel so you can see it in the chat. It's uh, Israel-Alma.org, uh, and you can right. find a lot of information there in the research and also on our educational programs. Right, and I and I would encourage people to please support Alma. Um, they're doing amazing work, and um, they're up there. You know, really risking their lives every day to try to get um, the truth out to the world. And that is something also that Ahmed believes in very strongly. We um, do not sugarcoat the truth. We bring it, um, you know, every single day with our work and our work on Capitol Hill. And um, we, we believe um, in our hearts that a well-informed public can possibly trickle up to well-informed policymakers so we can make good policy decisions in the future. So please support Alma. And also, if you can, please support um, the work of Amet. And you can go onto our website at um, www.ametonline.org. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarit. God bless you.